And we wait. And now we are live. And it's John Reed. And if I could get your name right, this will be great. I'm joined by Thomas Weber Knight. Did I get it right? Pretty much. <laughs> Excellent. Well, close Pretty enough for right. an ugly American. Excellent. Yes. Well, uh, we're going to talk about, uh, we're going to deconstruct so many CX buzzwords that C CX people aren't even going to be able to complete sentences by the time we're done, which is going to be great. Um, Thomas has crashed my show before, but this now this time you're an official guest. <laughs> so I get crashed, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So the thing about my show is that if you start commenting a lot, you might actually become a frequent guest. So you know, think about that before you write something into the mm. into the chat. Well, I tried for it. <laughs> <laughs> well, actually, too, the the funny thing is that I went off on this thing this week because there were a couple of big uh, vendor events. Uh, where they didn't like take any questions. So I was going to say, okay, save your questions to the end of my show from now on. But that's not true, folks. <laughs> you can crash the party at any time and ruin the show with your snarky remarks and questions. But let's try to keep them sharp and on topic as much as possible. But you are going to get your questions answered. Um, so this actually is the a Blogs That Matter edition of my show. And it's it, the idea is to draw attention to posts that really changed the conversation or changed how I think. Uh, I think too often these days we lose track of posts and we, we go to these short form sound bites. The problem is that the, the sound bites have no ability to help us deliver better enterprise projects, which is in theory why we're here. So I think blog posts have a much more direct relevance to that. And so blogs that matter or blogs, you, you know, you should have read, you idiot, or... <laughs> You know, subscribe to this blog right now. Something like that. I haven't got a good title yet, but that's the whole point. Um, so we're going to actually talk about a couple of incendiary blog posts that, that Thomas wrote, including how to not manage your customer journeys, uh, uh, which definitely uh, take a couple sacred cows right out to pasture. Why you don't want a 360-degree uh, view of the customer. Ouch. Um, I see marketing people are going to have a long weekend after that one. But before we get into those... I think it's really important to understand from the guests on this show how they develop their unique perspective on the market. So let's start there, Thomas. How do you develop your unique perspective on the market? Well, by being there for 25 years or so, meanwhile. So I've been there quite some time. I was part of CRM since before the name was coined. So there was Tom Siebel, I think, by the way. So mm. started with a small Salesforce automation company back there in Germany near a city called Waldorf, which coincidentally hosts one of these big players there. And guess what? They asked us to do their Salesforce automation and then they swallowed us. <laughs> so mm. this, this was where, where it all started. And, and, and they the, became giants of the CRM space. Whoops. Uh, actually. Uh, yeah, kind of. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> kind of giants. Yeah. <laughs> well, they grow and then they shrink and then they grow and then they shrink so the the biggest growth spurts happened when bob Stutz is there coincidentally these growth spurts happen where he is so <laughs> so right. I, I attribute quite some of the growth to him actually there well if esteban joins our chat later i'm sure he'll have plenty to say on these remarks so he's in there but anyhow well, so. He probably will not disagree. <laughs> exactly. So, so continuing on, so through, so your industry career informed your analysis. Well, the in, which led to well me being part of the development team, and then later on, since twenty eight, going into consulting, basically, well, drinking my own Kool Aid, um, eating my own dog food or well, having my own champagne was a bit of all of it, basically. So f from then on and doing some quality management before, you learn what is really asked for as opposed to what is delivered. Yes, and since I'm doing that since 28 in, in various roles in various places on this planet, so I started in, in Canada, moved on to New Zealand, then back to Germany. Right now I'm in the area of Seattle. You get a lot of perspectives, especially from project failures also, yeah, and from, well, safeguarding running projects, setting them up anew, building roadmaps, 
what people want, seeing what people want. So this is something that helps me quite a lot to find where where one should go or to express where, where I think one should go. And I always need to make this disclaimer. So I'm I'm not the godmaster here or 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 the god nor the godfather. <laughs> That's someone else. So that helps me building opinions. And at one point in time, I decided to express those opinions a bit more. And then one thing comes to the other. So all of the sudden, not all of the sudden, in, in, to growing intensity, you, you are then asked. Yes. And asked for giving an opinion about what someone else does. Yeah, And then from then on, you are getting far more insight into what other vendors are thinking, what other vendors are delivering, you are getting different argumentations. Then come discussions like the ones we had every now and then, which give different viewpoints, different point of views, new arguments that can be considered differently. And that helps building an opinion that can get expressed. So I wouldn't say it was accidentally, but it developed over time. Yeah, we're going to get more into that, I think, because I think you, you tread a very interesting line where I feel like you you have developed a certain level of not quite cynicism, but definitely very critical outlook towards certain kinds of what you might call vendor propaganda in our industry. And yet, you know, as someone who delivers projects still, you, you have to have a certain optimism that this technology can work. Otherwise, there would be no point. So sure. it seems like you're working to try to strike that proper balance of having a proper BS detector, but also seeing the potential, which is, oh, that, that which is tricky. Is potential. So, uh, I mean, it's always, I'm a German, right? We, we are talking about things that don't work. The, there's, a, there's a saying in German that says, not being punished is reward enough. Yeah, <laughs> typical German. <laughs> what what a, what a great mantra for living, Thomas. That, that's actually, no, so basically, I, I will say that probably serves you well during the pandemic. But <laughs> yeah, well, I hid in my I, in my hidey hole here. Um, no, in in general, so the mission that Ralph Marshall and I have as CRM evangelists, how we dub ourselves, is to to actually bring vendors and their customers a bit more into an orbit because what we see often is that that it's like that they are talking about each other they're even talking about the same thing but they are well passing each other so they are not necessarily getting into a really fruitful conversation uh, is rewarding brilliant or that is <laughs> josh yeah. josh greenbaum really likes you may, not, not you being may punished use that one. Not for me. He, josh really likes that i think i think that was the uplifting message that that josh <laughs> needed in his quest to improve enterprise yeah. projects so that's the literal translation of a german proverb so you don't even need to quote me <laughs> Uh, yeah, he he wants to build on that with the beating. The beatings will continue until morale improves. Yeah. <laughs> Excellent, Josh. Um, so yes, uh, I, I think that's probably the area where we need to shift the conversation into, like making sure we derive insights that, yeah. that are actually of some use here. Uh, <laughs> but uh, but yeah, so let me let me start in with with one of your with one of your uh, memorable blog posts here, which I pulled from your head. CRM blog. I'm not going to post all the links in the chat, but I will post the first one uh, so that people can find it. They can find your blogs in a couple locations. And by the way, the colleagues that, that Thomas referred to, you can catch them on their CRM combos show. I recommend you you find that through Thomas's Twitter handle. Uh, I've actually appeared on the show. They've had a lot of really distinguished guests also, so it's they have a good mix. <laughs> yeah, there, but, there was uh, a guy named John Reed there. Yeah, I crashed the show once. Uh, so let's talk about why you don't want a 360 degree view of the customer. And before we get into this post, I do want to point out that if 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 audience is assuming that this is like a men is an anti Salesforce gut punch by Thomas, we've already cleared up off the air what I suspected, which was he would wanted to go after sort of some general uh, misconceptions around this overhyped term that. 
a number of vendors have used in various ways. So I just wanted to make that clear up front uh, because I think this conversation is too important to limit it to attacking one vendor's personal propaganda. It's a it's a broader mythology, in my opinion, that a good chunk of the CRM industry has embraced. So why you don't want a 360 degree, degree view of the customer? And I want to just read briefly from your post um, that everyone says you want this type of view and you define it from tech target uh, 360 degree review of the customer is the idea sometimes considered unattainable that companies can get a complete view of customers by aggregating data from the various touch points a customer may use to contact the company to purchase products and receive service and support. I would add to that definition from tech target that a lot of times I think there's a real time implication behind the 360 degree view. Not that I, you would really want anyone to be, uh, observing you 360 degrees all the time, but I think the real-time view is part of what's implied. And then your next line, Tom, is you say, and you are fully sold to this famed concept and term. Now, I might have to object a little bit to that. I don't think I'm fully sold yet. Uh, so I'm pushing back a little bit, but let me just read the next part here. It said, in this case, I'm sorry for spoiling your day. So, and I'm sure you did ruin some days for certain marketing people out there. You in all likelihood do not have this 360 view view. And here you go, Thomas, you say you do not need it. And here's the kicker. You do not want it. So explain some of the views that inspired this post. Oh, well, we, <laughs> we all know, we all know Esteban. So it's getting really nice now. <laughs> No, yeah, the, Esteban, the, I think Esteban's going to have a few there. things to say today. Uh, he starts out with customer 360 after 30 years, promises never made it to the altar. Why stay engaged to the concept? Yeah. Uh, well, Esteban, the reason is because uh, marketers think it can sell some software. So that's that's why they're engaged yeah. to it at the moment. Um, anyway, Thomas, back to back to what inspired the post. Yeah. The, the real peeve I have with it is me being educated as a scientist. Yeah. So what what you have is maybe a complete and consistent set of data and information about your customer so now i'm i'm also a sailor so looking looking at things so i compare the customer and customer data as a kind of a north star so now I am somewhere relative to this North Star and I fail to understand how I will be able, ever be able to look at the same thing from 360 degrees at the same time, which is my original piece. So the, the admittedly slightly clickbaity title comes from that angle. Yeah? So you can't look at one thing at the same time from every angle, nor do you want to? What you have is a situation, a context, customer has a context where customer wants something, you want something, and this can be solved only if, if you use this context. Means an angle, an excerpt of this fur ball of customer data that you have that, that you interpret and bring into this context and then use. So th this is the abbreviated part. So that's why you don't want to have 360 or a complete view at the same time and use this complete view as, as at the same time. You always want to use a limited, well, a subset of this view that relates to the current context. That's what right. spurred it and what's basically also the message of the post. Yeah, the context piece is very interesting, right? Because a customer's context shifts quickly on the consumer side your context can shift almost from minute to minute yeah. right um what i have found very objectionable is the idea that ai can now step in and figure out what i need in this moment um, and that's what a lot of the context people seem to want to spread some ai um pixie dust on this notion mm, yeah. in in the b2b context I think the context can take longer to shift, right? So not always, yeah. but for example, you determine that one of your suppliers in a particular region is not going to function well, or there's a gas pipeline that got hit by ransomware to rip something from the headlines, and now you have to cope with that. Yeah. 
So I think the B2B context can can shift in a more intentional way. But but still to your point, there is a data problem underneath that, right? So you're not Several you're ways. criticizing the 360, but you're not denying there's a data problem that we need to solve. Oh, there is. You, a data you just want to, is it that you want to kind of narrow that data problem a little bit? Is that what your goal is, is to? No, ye yes and no. So from one, from one point of view, so I want to go away from, I would like to go away from this hyperbole that is, that is in there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Because that naming is just BS. Yeah, so it, it's not helpful. What you want to have is something that is relevant, complete, and consistent. So this brings us to the data problem. We don't have anything that is relevant, complete, and consistent. So we never will have it really complete. That we don't have it in a relevant or a consistent way caused the need for another buzzword. So you might want to pull your alarm right now. The, the, Uh-oh. Yeah, we are, like well, we are talking BS CDPs alarm. here right now. Yeah, got my BS yeah. alarm ready. Yeah, right. So that's caused the need for CDPs because uh, we don't have consistent data. Oh, 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 bullshit! Yeah, sorry. <laughs> uh, anyhow, <laughs> so I had to do that. Which is because, well, to some extent, because we created silos. So mm. the data needs to be brought back into something that can be handled in at least a consistent way. It doesn't need to live in the same database, but you need to relate it to each other, the different elements, and you need, need to be able to use them in one way, to create a filter in one way that helps in this very moment. Mm -hmm. So this is where, where the context is, and even if it changes fast, this the very moment is the context. What I, as a customer, want to achieve right now is giving a huge part of the context. Other parts yes. you never will get. Yes, I think you're hitting on something very important here. It's a data problem, but isn't it also a customer empowerment problem? And and I don't I'm not going to skip ahead to your next post just yet, but but we will get into it in a little bit on how to not manage your customer journeys. But my objection to context is is thinking that AI will solve it. What I like is thinking about how can you empower the customer in the context they find themselves in? to do what they need to do. To me, that is a design problem, right? Because if you can create a situation where if a customer has an issue, they can escalate it to their satisfaction in the form that they need, then haven't you solved a lot of your 360 problems? No, yes, yes, yes and no. So, I mean, what do you need this consistent set of data for, mm. which is engagement? So you, you don't collect it just for collecting purposes, right? Mm. Uh, AI is maybe pixie dust. <laughs> it, it, let's call it advanced analytics. So then it's helpful. Yeah? And to some extent, without looking at the merits or dismerits of, of AI, of the term AI also is it is helpful when you can limit the context enough. Yeah. So now the context that you can work on, work with, with current technological means is pretty short term. There, I fully agree with you. Yeah? So what you have is my click stream. What you have is maybe, hopefully, not only maybe, but hopefully my consent. What you also should have is my interests, which then takes a lot of the guesswork out of what the context might be. Yeah? If my interest is getting a new car, then we, then uh, coming back to that a little later. Um, if, if we are coming, can delimit the context via data information that I give voluntarily enough, then an AI has an easier job or an analytical system has an e easier job. And yes. They will need to have an easier job because we don't have strong AI yet, simple as, and which probably will take another, well, your guess is as good as mine, but some years. Yeah. So 
getting back to the information, you have this information, you use it, then you can engage and we can engage, mutually engage. Which brings me to managing the journey, right? We, you can't dis, you you can't take these ideas separately because right. you need the data to engage. Yeah, right? and without engagement, there's no experience. So the whole experience community communication yeah. will fail. Yeah. And and I want before you get there, I want to actually talk about engagement because I don't want to use the word engagement without attempting to define what it means. Um, before we do that, I do want to get to Esteban briefly here. Yeah, Esteban, I just looked Est at the side and on his screen as well. Est Esteban's objecting to the design problem thing. It's an understanding of the customer and contextual awareness via tech. Cannot design a better solution. Don't make it come back. Well, yes and no, Esteban. I mean, my my problem is more that I I object to the idea that AI can solve the context problem. I do think AI can solve certain problems. I want to be clear about that. I just I just think it's an overreach in that case. Like, for example, I was looking at one of your competitors, Esteban, and how they are using, and I'm about to write about this on Diginomica, shameless plug, about how they're using AI to identify customers that are due for churn um, mm -hmm. or, or potential churn loss of SaaS subscription. And I do think that AI can be very good at, at defining and finding characteristics of customers do for turn that a human could not. So that's an example of how I think AI can intervene in the customer relationship in a helpful way. But I object to the idea that moment to moment, the AI can guess what is on my mind. The reason I think it's a design issue is because if you give the customer some tools to solve their own problems, then you don't have to try to guess what the hell they're thinking all the time. So anyhow, mm -hmm. um, but let's talk about engagement for it. let's talk about engagement for a minute though because I don't want to use that term loosely. You yeah. use the word engagement in a positive sense. So what's positive about engagement? Why is it a good goal and and, and what what do you get out of it? As a customer or as a vendor? As a vendor trying to engage customers. I mean you mentioned that as a positive step. So it is a positive thing. So because Let's start with a negative touch here. So what I do think is that the three P of the marketing world get increasingly commoditized. So price, product, placement, and well, there's a fourth P if you want. So that doesn't really distinguish you anymore. So what and there, there I largely agree to the common opinion that what distinguishes you as a vendor will be the experience that you are able to, well, that you allow your customer to have, yeah? so mm. that you offer. Yeah? So you can't, as a customer, you can't have an experience without an engagement. So right. means what you need to do as a vendor is to make, to, to incentivize me as a customer to be in a continuous, sometimes, Intense, sometimes not intense, but continuous engagement with you as a vendor in order right. for me to get my challenges solved. Whatever I want, be, that be, a, be it a micro challenge right now, that or be it the, an overarching challenge, so the bigger problem. Yeah, so And the, right. the, the, the micro challenges lead to the solution of the bigger one. So it's a step-by-step -step process. So and when you can distinguish yourself there in a way that you make me stay with you, then this is good for your business because then you have me as a customer. And if you do that often enough, I'm even a captivated customer or a captive customer because I want to be captive. What mm -hmm. can be better than that? Yeah, um, and, and Josh says, using AI for turn makes a lot of sense. If it informs me of something I didn't know and gives me some reason to act, that's great. Yeah. Using it in real time to try to second guess me is fraught with privacy problems and the real potential of getting my intentions completely wrong. That's exactly what I was trying to say. And and yes, there's some there's an interesting AI turn conversation. I don't want to get into all of it now, but 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 it's obvious that AI um, can 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 identify certain yeah. behaviors more effectively and more efficiently than than a human. Uh, scrolling through uh, usage statistics can figure out. So there, that's an interesting conversation for another time. Uh, but Thomas, in terms of your your description here, let me see if I can capture it. So you you think it, engagement with the customer is a positive because it leads to better experiences. 
And I'm assuming that you're also implying that better experiences lead to customer loyalty. Is that is that yes. how you see it? Yes. And that loyalty is obviously a net positive because retaining customers is much easier than trying yeah. to find them somewhere. So is that a good summary of your position? That's a good summary. And there's a little okay. wrench in there, of course, as well, because the ex everybody wants to manage experience right now in the software industry, which, which is another funny thing because the, there may be, maybe I emphasize on that one, one person on this whole planet that can manage my experiences. And this is me. And if I'm if I'm in a bad mood, I can't even do that. <laughs> right. Absolutely. Okay. Well, let's dig into your next blog post in your in our blogs that matter show because I think if we hold off on it any longer, it will prevent you from explaining your first blog post. So let's get to your next one. How to not manage your customer journeys, your customers' journeys. I think Esteban will enjoy this one also. Uh, it is time to talk about customer journeys and customer journey orchestration. So what is your grievance with managing customer journeys? And by the way, a lot of people hate the word journey, so I want to throw that out there uh, as well as a problematical term. But what is your issue there? The issue is that mostly companies try to create a road for me that I shall take. Step by step, bus stop by bus stop. And well, they basically confine me to their way or want to confine me to their way, which is not the way people work basically so if if you're looking what we are all doing on on the web and or elsewhere we we come with well i want let's take the mortgage example again so i want a mortgage whether i pronounce that right or wrong so i'm in the market for a mortgage so i start looking around i land up on end up on a banks or a broker's website and then i don't have any time anymore so i do something else I continue this via my via an app on my mobile. Continue then to my iPad because I get a get to another step. Then I have a meeting with well, have a beer with a couple of people. All of a sudden they tell me something else. So I take some steps back. Then I go forward again. So the, the message there is that you can't just create a way for me because that's the way you want me to go i go my own way so basically i manage my own journey so what's the consequence there the consequence there is actually pretty simple and not much needs to get changed except a bunch of mental positions actually so i still need the interaction points but what i do not need is to have them connected to each other forcefully so what I need is a way to get from one interaction point to another one in a meaningful way. And this meaningful way is determined by data again and by information again, because you need to be able to identify me. With that, you know, if you can do that, you know what I did before so that you can suggest maybe another position, but you can provide me with the answer to the issue that is right at hand right now. And there we are back to the post before. For that, you better have good information and maybe even a, a good AI that allows to offer real-time interaction management, which is exactly mm -hmm. what is happening there if I'm on the web. I, I don't want to wait five minutes till the right answer comes up. I want to have it right now when I click on the next link, when I follow the next link, and I want to continue from there. You do that as what? Esteban says you don't need that. You do that as a customer. My role as the org vendor is to allow you to do that. Right. Right. Allow yeah. me to do that. Right. You as a vendor, as an organization, you provide me with a menu of touch points, to yeah. use the industry term. That Esteban, I can Esteban just corrected himself and said, enable, not allow. That's for the podcast audience is listening to this later. Uh, I think that's a valuable correction. Uh, right. I mean, to be honest with you, I could, I could do without journey at all. I think, you know, yeah. when, when was the last time you heard anybody outside of a, 
enterprise software marketing departments say, how was your day? Oh, I, I went on an interesting consumer journey this morning. Let me tell you about that. No one. No one did. No that. one talks no one like them. nobody talks like that. Quit talking like that. Yeah. No one talks like that. But um, but but I do like your analogy to some extent because you know, if you're thinking, well, uh let's say Los Angeles is is someone who's not a customer and New York is someone who's loaded up on all kinds of your stuff right. and is probably gonna subscribe to more. Right. Well, there's all kinds of ways to get from LA to New York, True. right? And, and, and so my job is to kind of make sure that wherever you land, that pit stop is giving you what you need in that moment yeah. in time. Right. Yeah. So I can probably make some guesses on the map a little bit as to yeah. where the frequent stops are. That may be where AI comes in a little bit, perhaps. Uh, perhaps yeah. But, but I, but I think it's very interesting what you say, because now real time gets more interesting because now you start thinking about where are the points in that where real time is really going to make a difference. Right. Because in some cases, it makes all the difference. Uh, sure. Like you said, if I'm on a website and I'm having trouble figuring out what, you know, if this product is compatible with my current operating system, well, I need that information now. Like, uh, so then real time is everything. So yeah. that's where it gets interesting is instead of pretending like everything is real time all the time, mm -hmm. like when is it important? So I like your, your framework here. What what kind of reaction did you get? Were people bummed out that you threw out the customer journey management model, or no, not not really? So the, at the end of the day, it is pretty similar to to what people are doing, right? So they they are offering interaction points. They are thinking more. Well, the ones who prescribe it journey so i'm not that i don't have a much of a problem with that way because of well you, you used the example as well going to new york from, from from seattle to new york is a journey right from from starting coming with a challenge to having it solved can be compared mm -hmm. to a journey as well okay so the main right, difference so we we'll use well, well we're going to let you use the word journey for the rest of this <laughs> conversation then okay fair thank enough you. Fair enough. Just don't hit Go the ahead. red button too often. Go ahead. Way. I will not hit the red button. You're, you've, you have a so pass. The, the main difference is the thinking is not inside out, but outside in. Yeah, coming to think from a customer. The what you have in general all the time is you have those interaction points. You have them. What you where where thinking needs to get or needs to change for them, which is not too much of a stretch, is that you just don't map it out for me in in a way that you do well do the Google Maps thing, enter point A, enter point B, and then you're getting the best way. But get it more into developing the whole map for me or offering me the whole map with possible routes that I then can take at my choosing. That's basically it. So and th that is a an analogy that most people understand and subscribe to pretty pretty soon, actually. I mean, mm -hmm. after all, there are one or two vendors in the journey orchestration world that propagate this point of view as well. So I'm, the good news is I'm not alone with that thinking. Josh says, journeys are a good analytical framework for understanding how people interact with systems. Yes. The trick is to understand what the ideal is supposed to look like and recognize most real-world journeys will deviate from the ideal. Then the yeah. job is to work with customers on whatever version of the journey they prefer. Esteban right. comes at it from a distant angle and different angle and says, what I don't understand is why is this an issue if we all agree on the poor value of journeys? <laughs> all right. Can you reconcile that, Thomas? Uh, well, if, if if you're putting back Josh's text, uh, his statement, so b basically he, he says pretty much the same. So w when you are looking at journey mapping, at the process of journey mapping, what we do is we create something that is, well, either an average or, well, the most used one or whatever it is. So we create one. So what we actually want to do, as we have bunches of customers, hopefully, what we want to do is identify the ways that are they are using in order to possibly support them, doing it mm -hmm. their way, 
And there we are back to doing it the customer way, right? Supporting the customer. So th the concept as such is, in my eyes, not, well, it's not wrong. Yeah. Implementation of consulting offerings there to map the customer journey are likely a bit short. So you can't work with few customers in order to identify the way because there is not the way. What you need is a hell of a lot of analytics to identify how people that enter with a particular challenge come to a solution mm. and then identify where the pain points are in order to make it easier for these customers to get there. And all of a sudden we have proper engagement and Op <laughs> I don't say million. <laughs> I don't want you puking. Esteban. As Devon says, if you say million journeys of one, I will puke. Uh, well, I'm definitely not going to say it because I'm on record as objecting to the journeys <laughs> term entirely. So, I'm, But Thomas, I guess that's one for you. Be careful. Yeah. want to keep the show clean at this point. Yeah, we, we don't want that. <laughs> we don't want any mess. <laughs> no. Tom, Tom, Thomas, can I, can I ask you... Uh, a, a related point, which is uh, often these kinds of discussions also revolve around development of personas. Mm -hmm. So uh, in, in the B2B world, for example, when you're breaking down a, a, a decision to purchase, mm -hmm. you, you look at various, traditionally, you look at various types of personas and how they influence the purchase cycle. Mm -hmm. And then you figure out how are we engaging with these personas. In theory, each of those personas would have a quote unquote journey. Uh, so do you buy into that? Well, a persona at the end of the day is an aggregation again. You know? mm -hmm. So they are helpful, but, but not the full way, right? Mm -hmm. As long as you, as a vendor, have the goal of offering a very limited number of pathways, that lead from A to B, then personas are highly interesting. If you start to get the other way around, so what can I do in order to help you who goes through it to help you, then personas become less interesting. And at the risk now of causing a mess on someone's floor, what you need to do is analyze the the pathways that many people do analyze where and how they get to a resolution analyze the ones that well went off the wrong <laughs> took the wrong exit to to continue on the pathway example um, how to help them not taking the in my eyes wrong exit but stay on 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 a path that helps not only them but me in the in the same instance as well so that that is analytics and from then on we can start weeding out where the problems are and from then on we can also in the best idea of paul's definition so they're offered by the company chosen by the customer you know? then, then we can offer to different customer segments then we are doing segmentation here different differently incentivized pathways that they can choose from simply mm -hmm. as well. but the, the difference is not creating a way it's creating a map and a network of roads that's the difference in thinking and that that will help us there and all of a the sudden then we don't really need the personas that urgently anymore mm -hmm. and i don't say it's a wrong thing it's just sometimes a little misleading who says that persona a is more important than persona b Right. Okay. And, and, and in your view, is this notion of an integrated data platform that, that breaks down the main enterprise silos and provides analytics across plat across applications and such, do you think, let's say that's a multi-year goal, do you think it's still a goal that companies should pursue with quick wins along the way that are more realistic? Or do you think companies should just give up on ever really having a unified data platform? No, they should, by all means, they should strive for it. So it will stay a lofty goal and they, in all likelihood, will never, 
well, they will never achieve the objective as it is painted now, because mm -hmm. it's a moving target. So, but based on what their objectives are, they have priorities, and if they want to be successful, they need to engage properly with me and need to offer me a proper way to engage with them. Mm. So means they need, and now, now we are getting back to the customer data, they, they need a consistent set of information about me. With that, a consistent set of data about me. They're in all likelihood data that I voluntarily gave them. So they're, well, let's let's name a vendor here. I worked. Ah, uh, here we go. For, I worked fifteen years for SAP. Here's my tattoo. So th they are doing something there, very right there. So they are st starting, and other vendors are going in that direction too. Meanwhile, they are starting from the customer identity and the consent and preferences, because that is where the real value is. That takes some strain out of the AI, and that makes information far better informed. So that at any point in time, the context is better, that a good or a small number of good interaction points can be offered to me via personalization means, via segmentation means, via, at that point in time, real-time interaction, very likely, so that I can take my choice that helps me getting forward towards my solution. Uh, and now I had nearly used another buzzword or abbreviation JTB, JTB, job to be, right? So uh, the job I, want, I want a solution, right? And you as a vendor want to help me getting to that solution, mm -hmm. thereby making business. Well, it's probably one of the trends in, in the CRM industry that I'm most excited about. Uh, and obviously it's hard to get me to confess my excitement about these things because that's not my persona. <laughs> but... <laughs> But I, I do like I do like this notion of opt opt in. I do like this notion of earning trust through transparent data yeah. sharing, because I see it as a, almost a very old school way of doing business. Where when you provide me with value, I share something of equal value mm -hmm. with you. It's a value exchange, and yeah. the more value that you provide, the more I share. And and especially if I'm doing this in a conscious way. Yeah. I think where where these big consumer sites have gone so terribly wrong is they they have claimed opt-in, but it's really buried somewhere in the Facebook terms of service somewhere. Mm -hmm. It's not a true opt-in in that if people were truly conscious of how their data was being used, I think they would not be quite as happy. <laughs> and yeah. and so it's not it's not a full opt-in, right? It's 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 an excuse laden legalistic opt-in. And I think what's exciting about what's next, and this gets into the whole cookie list thing and mm. that a lot of advertisers are are flummoxed about, but it's this notion of, yeah, earn the trust. And and to your point, now you have probably better data and now suddenly your AI is suddenly a lot smarter yeah. than it used to be. <laughs> Wow, funny how that works. Yeah, so, yeah. <laughs> it's the thing that, well, Josh in different, said in different words before, right? I would say rubbish in, rubbish out. Yeah. So and Indeed. If, if you can avoid the, the inside and improve the, the intake, then the output will be better, regardless of what. So you, you can combine that with all sort of external data that helps as well. But the in the data that you have, the first level data, the first person data, and the second person data that I give you makes makes it second person because I give it to you. That is what gives the real value. And that is what helps you helping me. And if you help me, you make business. If you help me twice, then you make more business because I trust you more and more to use that word. And I know that I get a solution from you. So why should mm -hmm. I go elsewhere? Yep. I think it's a very appealing model for B2B. I think in B2C, there's some interesting nuances as far as how hard, hardcore and fickle certain consumers can be, but it's still a it's still a good model to, to talk about, yeah. spend time with. I, before we uh, finish our show today, I do want to get into the great ecosystem debate, <laughs> which <laughs> you uh, found yourself in the middle of. And you have promised an upcoming blog post, so this can also serve as a preview. 
to get subscribed to Thomas's blog because in the next number of weeks we're going to get an ecosystem post. But you have no, I'm in your yeah, <laughs> yeah, it's it's a big commitment you're making here on a live on air, Thomas. Uh, but but it, you have posted a couple of things. Uh, you did a show actually with Esteban Kolsky of SAP, who's in the chat, around some of these ecosystem skirmishes. It's a word I hate much more than journeys. So I have very little tolerance for the word, but that's that's kind of a semantic thing. I think what the word represents is real. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm not gonna I'm not gonna spend too much time bashing the buzz the buzzword because I think there's something real behind it. Yeah. So so what what it, why do you think this debate happened, and what do you think? Why should we be talking about ecosystems anyway? Well, it's from from an outset i'd say it's like nature you know so you somehow need to be able to create a, another big word a symbiosis of participants in a well out, out of a group of entities you know, just to be very abstract here yeah? so now all of them have their goals that they want here, yeah, Esteban, so we, we don't have a better word right now. So, um, yeah. <laughs> um, Esteban hates the word and loves the concept. Yeah, so. The concept is great. Yeah. I, I don't have a better word, so uh, hence yeah. I stick to it. So We're, we're going to allow everyone to use the yeah. word ecosystem for so, the remainder so of the you, show. So. For what you want for all participants in this group of key stakeholders or stakeholders in general is they all want to have value, get something, get some result. They have often conflicting, sometimes parallel interests, which changes. And nature shows us this works best if it's not in a, in a purely competitive environment where well, both of us or both parties, three parties involved, uh, pull their guns and uh, shoot at each other. Th this creates a, a triple loss or at least a double loss. Yeah? So if you're looking at the gunfight at OK Corral, yeah, there's not many people standing over after. So all parties want to gain value out of it. This happens only if they do that in a sort of another buzzword, cooperative environment. So sometimes they compete, sometimes they cooperate. Mm. And then now the real fun starts is they they need to want to stay in, in this group of participants. Means whether this word is liked or not or appropriate there or not, it needs to have there needs to be a concept of fairness somewhere which is a purely individual concept. So your concept of what is fair is different from mine. Yeah. So, But both of us need to be in an environment where we want to stay in, where we think that the investment that we take there pays off for us. Yeah. Um, right. So just a couple of very quick things. Do you, do you think of ecosystems in this context as primarily revolving around a particular vendor that's at the center of an ecosystem? Is that how you think of it? That's part of the problem. <laughs> As most of them are set up right now, is they are to the benefit of the hub. The hub is usually a big vendor. Right. Yeah, so in there, there you can go through whatever industry. So one vendor sets... I think I saw a wildlife show about this. There was a big whale, and it was just eating all these smaller fish at its discretion. Yeah. And then other fish came and ate those fish. Is that kind of like what we're talking about here? Yeah, kind of. Whereas, look at look at the shark and pilot fish. Uh, the pilot fish definitely has some value for the shark. Definitely. So they are not eating them. <laughs> yeah. And yeah. So, but that's a problem, right? Because yeah. that that type of ecosystem is is sort of being defined by a large whale, right? Um, not necessarily interest of the customers, which start to feel like potential sort of casualties in this in this natural environment. Yes, the customers are the first casualty if it's built like that. Smaller partners are probably the second casualty because they right. 
Well, well, then the ecosystem itself suffers, right? Because if the smaller parties feel like they are betrayed, then they pull out again. Mm. And so and then the ecosystem itself is hurt, means the customer gets hurt, means the holder of the ecosystem gets hurt again. Is so this different end, than is this different than community the way we use it in an enterprise context? What is a community? A co community is a group of light like minded people. <laughs> Alan, you lunch came man. at a you came at an awkward moment. I was just you, you missed lunch. I was just undermining vendor ecosystems by using the analogy of whales and sharks and the customers as little minnows or what have you. Uh, but but it's actually a debate that flared up on LinkedIn that I do think has some important relevance to customers. So we are going to try to before we wrap the show succeed in defining why this debate matters. So we're, we're still working on that, Alan. So you hopefully will get a a resolution to that before we wrap up anyway <laughs> so so you see it you see ecosystems and communities as different what is the difference well communities in general i'd say are far more informal mm -hmm. there are I, i think there are a subset of or well i think one is a subset of each other yeah so Communities often don't serve a purpose as well. Ecosystems regularly do. And what does it say? Are not ecosystems? Yeah, well, they they are not the same. Yeah. So right. they are more informal. They are not directed. Communities often are self-organized, which current breeds of ecosystems are not. There's always a manager somewhere in there. That actually sounds like a good thing to me, but anyway. Yeah, I wasn't I wasn't judgmental. Yet. No, I realize <laughs> that. I, I'm, I'm, actually, inserting, I'm, inserting, I'm responsible it, for that. It might be beneficial for ecosystems if they become a bit more self-organizing. <laughs> that was actually what I wanted to continue. But, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so, so why did we have a LinkedIn debate over this topic? Why were people getting flared up? What, what was going on there? I think the the origin is that there's not even a clean point of view about how an ecosystem should look like, what an ecosystem is. Communities often, I said, Esteban. <laughs> And one, one Esteban of took issue with, with the statement that communities don't serve a purpose. <laughs> uh, yeah. we'll, we'll set that to the side for a moment because I, I really need to understand why we had a debate about yeah. ecosystems on LinkedIn because like... It, it would take a lot of work to get me to feel passionate yeah. about the concept. So I need to understand why people are getting upset about this concept. It, is it because it, the the potential is unrealized at this time or we don't I agree think, on what, what it is or. Uh, well, the, this, the discussion that you now refer to started with a statement that it's all about the customer, which caused violent, uh, which right. caused a violent discussion. No, violent, not in terms of physically violent, but a very intense discussion. Yeah. So, which leads me to the conclusion that right now we don't even have a good idea of how a community, not a community is that as well, but an ecosystem should be set up where mm -hmm. the value lies. We, we talked about trust, we talked about faith, we talked about value in there. And One said it's important, other people say don't care, right? And not important at all. So this to me means is that as a an industry, we haven't really understood yet how to set up an ecosystem at a bigger scale in a way that goes towards an ideal. So we don't have a real definition yet that helps all involved parties getting a maximum of value for them without causing too much damage somewhere else. This is where I would put the fairness thought in there. Yeah. Esteban people, says we're having a debate because, as is often the case, most people use the term without knowing what it means and then take their right. personal definitions to heart. Uh, I think that that, that yeah, makes that sense. It's far more elegant and, than what I and just And they said. wanted to make them about customer focus or customer centricity, ridiculous, as not a single part of an ecosystem constitutes its purpose. 
Um, that's fair enough. I mean, look, look, I mean, I think, I, I think I, I'm going to need some persuasion before I'm willing to have like a show dedicated to ecosystems, for example. Um, but I, I will say that community, as I understand it, does matter to me quite a bit, and mm-hmm. and I be- and I believe it's an underrated criteria in how prospects evaluate uh, vendors per se. Um, mm-hmm. Whether you want to say that it's a combination of communities and ecosystems is fine by me. I'm not going to. Uh, object if it's some combination of the two but i do think it's 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 very important from a competitive advantage position and i've seen vendors frankly squander what i think was their advantage in a community and ecosystem mm-hmm. sense yeah. and i think the morale of a community and ecosystem is extremely palpable um when we return to actual events uh we will see more signs of this again mm-hmm. um but you can certainly see it online to some extent as well I think it impacts purchases and renewals and all that stuff. Yeah. Um, but 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 I also think even deeper than that, I think it impacts project success because I think that customers that have access to diverse, skilled experts who are eager to help them solve their problems yeah. get a benefit. So I can't produce statistics on that, but I believe it. So I'll wait for the stats to support my belief later. Yeah. Joshua, thank you for joining and thank you for participating and making it Thanks for participating. Making us yeah. smarter. Yeah. So, I mean, communities are a necessity, as evidenced by uh, how they are used and implemented by basically all bigger vendors. Yeah. Yep. So, on the other hand, there we, we need to be careful as well because, well, cynicism, cynicism, flag on. Many right. of the vendors are using communities to outsource their support. Right. Absolutely. So cynicism flag off. Yeah. So this is something that we we yeah we need we need to take care of as well. Right? So communities are helpful in order to come to knowledge. Communities are very helpful in order to create knowledge as well. But they are not ecosystems. They are fully worth, worth, especially not business ecosystems. They are fully worth Esteban. What now the perfect definition of an ecosystem is, I don't know yet. I, really I don't know, know either. Yet. I'm struggling there as well. I don't know either. But one thing I would say is that in general, in our industry, I believe that we need more organized and vocal customer user groups that are that are self-organized around their own interests and they're not dependent on vendors for financing whatsoever. Mm. And that speak for the collected yeah. aggregated voice of the customer and exercise influence where customers cannot. Mm. I think I think vendors would be very surprised what they hear from their customers once customers have a more vocal and organized voice because I think many customers are intimidated into a more uh, passive point of view on a lot of issues than they would be if they had powerful support behind them. I'm not saying that solves your ecosystem power imbalance problems, but I would say mm-hmm. that it, it's a certainly one, if you want to talk about a health indicator, that would be one I'd be looking for. <laughs> um, answer to Alan, y- yes, sometimes I can. <laughs> Do you see me wearing a hat right now? <laughs> Alan, you missed the beginning of the, pod- the, the podcast and discussion where I actually got into that with Thomas because I think it's a critically important point and uh, you know, I, and I want to answer the question for Thomas, but uh, but I have figured out already in my interaction with Thomas that there's quite a bit of intellectual curiosity as well. And you know, I wouldn't have anyone on my show for an hour who did not have that because otherwise it's just a snark festival. And as much as I enjoy snarky comments to undermine enterprise convention, that's not why I'm doing the show. I'm doing the show so we can have better projects. And it, I realize that we can't accomplish that every week, but that's the goal is to gather together the insights to help us to be smarter and better and to serve customers better because that's all of our jobs in the end. I don't care whether we work for vendors or customers or influencers or whoever it is. We're not delivering enough quality projects, period. So that's why this show exists. Back to back to Esteban ecosystem. says ecosystems equal porn. You know it when I see it. I like that. <laughs> yeah. So, okay. So Esteban's volunteering himself to do an ecosystem uh, sort of validation of approval 
I like this sort of like the seal that you can kind of get on. Maybe you can put it on your LinkedIn company profile with a nice picture of Esteban and his microphone that I took. That'd be cool. With with all the imperfections that current business ecosystems have. So let's take all the big vendors with their hub and spoke models yeah, or quite some big consulting companies as well, which created systems, ecosystems around themselves. They helped not only the, well, the owner of the ecosystem. So now the question of power balance remains. The question of could they have helped more and better, that remains as well. But so far, with all the imperfections that are there, it was important that they got set up the way, well, at all. Yeah. So this... This did quite an amazing job, yeah. And even if some of the the user groups are actually dependent on on funding of the main vendor in there or not, so, some of the companies that are participating in those user groups are big enough to say a word, even if funding comes out of that direction. Yeah. I mean, there are industry companies starting with an S as well that have a say. Right. Yeah. And, and look, I mean, I think the thing that my big objection to the word is I see a lot of people using it who seem to imply when they use it, that, that it's a term that validates the health of their community. Mm. It's like, Oh, you know, our ecosystem these days. And it's like, well, you're, if you're like most vendors, your ecosystem probably needs a lot of work. Mm. So you know, the interesting thing about ecosystems in the natural world is that they tend to be, without human interference, they tend to be pretty self-sustaining. I don't know if that's true of our vendor ecosystems. I think they're actually imperfect works in progress at best. Esteban, thanks for showing up. Good yeah. luck with good luck thanks, with Esteban. your air, air compressor. Absolutely. Thanks for your comments. Yeah. Um, and Thomas, I think we've sort of reached the point of uh, extracting about as much insight as we possibly yeah. can without without having ergonomic problems start to set in for both of us. So uh, we're going to call it in a sec here. Um, do you have any final comments on today's discussion? Uh, except that it was fun. <laughs> cool. So, no, so the, in general, so I, I love this format. You know? And what, what I really love also is the insightful engage engagement <laughs> coming from the participants. So there, you usually have a number of very smart people in here. And that makes yeah. it really, really interesting to also come forward with snarky comments because you know there will be a, rebu a, a rebuttal. Yeah? There will be some, coming something back, which then gives food for thought. And that is the real value. So there's food for thought. This means this first furthers the discussion and helps all of us. Yeah, I mean, I, it's my view that, that the participants in, in these chats are often as insightful as anyone yeah. who has a microphone. And so I want to include them from the beginning yeah. of the discussion. And, and there's, it forces us to make constant course corrections. And, and yeah. also, I'm, I'm a longtime advocate of more interactive formats. And so I have to prove... <laughs> to the world well. as much as I possibly can that this, this format is yeah. if not superior at least deserves a look I mean yeah. I, I was on three different webinars this week for different vendors where they overmanaged their presentation they overmanaged their their stilted customer segments and then at the end yeah. they they opened up for this pathetic drip of questions and yeah. I'm just frustrated that after a year and a half in the pandemic that this is happening so often yeah. And I realized that it takes courage and work to create a better format, but uh, I want to encourage folks out there to take those steps because there's so many good things that can happen as a, as a result of, of doing it yeah. in this type of way. And one of the best things, Thomas, is we don't know what we're going to get. So it's, you know, but, but getting derailed a lot by people is, I think, really good because, it, you know, like there were a lot of points made today that you and I wouldn't have thought of. So... And as far as the final uh, whiffs, uh, I, I sometimes mention a couple. Um, 
that I note in my Enterprise Hits and Misses weekly column, which goes out on Monday, which is what inspired this show. Uh, today, I wrote about how I'm learning from the PR peeps in my inbox, who are often <laughs> the subject of my inspiration. I said, did you know that Generation C, um, which is, by the way, Thomas, Generation Connected, they are born digital. Okay, so that's okay. Generation C, is now being replaced by Generation N, which is Generation Novel. I think that stands for the novel coronavirus, but I'm not sure. This genera generation is not age-bound and was created in just 90 pandemic days, and they are... I guess they are a ruthless digital only generation that is forcing brands to have a, a accountability with their digital processes. So anyway, Which just so you know, it's now it's about generation N now. So uh, anyway, that, that might make my next weekly. We shall see, but it's a contender. Yeah. Big one. So I was wondering about the generation N as well. It popped up in my inbox too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, generation in. So uh you got you gotta hand it to the PR piece for being being creative and yeah. <laughs> uh, I you know it, it's funny because all joking aside, the one thing I do like about what they put in there is detaching these generations from age because I think like age is becoming less and less helpful of a determinant in terms of behavior and stuff. So it's interesting to have those conversations, but anyhow, uh, I don't need to use new terminology like generation N just yet, but <laughs> it's an interesting point. So anyway, I hope you guys catch Thomas on his regular CRM combo show with his gang. It's always lively mm. and uh, keep track of that. this plug. Yeah, please do. <laughs> next, next Tuesday, an hour later than usual, but with Ray Wang. Oh, you got Ray. Oh, okay. nice. That would be cool. Nice. Uh, another very vocal person. So that, that's yeah, cool. absolutely. It'll be interesting to see if you can keep keep his keep him off his uh, Twitter feed during your discussion. Yeah, be a good challenge for you. Yeah, he would so, be. Yeah. <laughs> but then we are three of us. So <laughs> yeah, so there's three of you, so you can carry the show no matter what. Anyhow, uh, definitely a pleasure, and I I'm glad you like this format. To me, digging into significant blog posts is, is a really fun show and i'll definitely be returning to that format on a regular basis though i'm also going to continue to do my countdown format because that can be really fun as well so yep. anyhow thomas thank you so much for joining thanks Appreciate for having it. me <laughs> yep. Cheers. later